And good morning, everybody. We are the North Carolina History Theater coming to you on Thursday morning, as we always do. Actually, on time this week. Last week, we got started like 20 minutes late or something. But uh, today, we are actually on time because I was awake at 6.30. So it, it got me here on time. And we've got Mr. Ken Hess here, co-hosting along with us. Hey, Ken. And our special guest of the day, Simon Spaulding. Good morning. Yeah, y'all. <laughs> many of you know Simon. He is the man of a million instruments. <laughs> And uh, so we, we've got a few things going here today. Uh, tonight is the opening, in case you haven't heard, of the Mark Twain program over at the North Carolina at the North Carolina History Center. That is the name of the place. Um, at seven o'clock, and it'll be Friday at seven o'clock, seven thirty. Friday at seven thirty. Saturday at seven thirty. Sunday at two. Tickets are still available. You can get them at the door. You can get them online at www.nchistorytheater.org. Or you can drop into the Historical Society and talk to those fine people over there on 501 Broad Street and get tickets there. And I got that all out in one breath. Was I not oh. impressive? And I'll be there Amazing. filming you. And you will be there filming there. So and uh, it should be a, an interesting evening. Lots of Mark Twain stories and thoughts and critique, criticisms that he did later in his life. So if you don't know much about Mark Twain, come and find out all about him. And since we're on Mark Twain, we're going to look at a little bit at what Mr. Twain is perhaps most famous for, and that is his riverboat days, <clears throat> which were actually very short days. Uh, riverboating, that was, uh, people get the idea that that was something that happened for 100 years or something. And actually, the heyday of riverboats was relatively brief, was it not? Uh, yeah. It, b prior to that, there were keel boats and flat boats which um, could be, if the wind was blowing, you could sail them upstream. Otherwise, you had to cordel, mm -hmm. uh, which is with a very heavy cable called a cordel. Uh, a lot of the, the, the lingua franca of the Mississippi uh, uh, River prior to steamboats was French and not English. And so a lot of the words relating to those mm -hmm. boats are, are, are French, like cordel, which is a cable you attach right. to your mast. And it's sort of, you know, this way the crew is sort of like the mules on a towpath on the Erie Canal, except that there isn't a towpath. Uh -huh. <laughs> and there aren't, there aren't any mules either. It's the crew. And, and in flood season, you had to go a couple of miles to find dry land in order to, to haul them along. Right, right. So sometimes cordling wasn't even an option. And then along come steamboats uh, in the, uh, the early 19th century. And that's mm -hmm. a great idea because you can just steam up the river. Okay, and that was, of course, Mr. Fulton over there on the Hudson. Correct. Right. He, he did well, the first he, one. Yeah, he wasn't the first to make a steamboat, but he was the first to make them make them popular. And uh, uh, Newburn had one of the early steamboats, the yes, Coderus. It was a, a metal one, mm -hmm. and it was originally built up on, I think, the Susquehanna River up in Pennsylvania. Right, and shipped down here. And yeah. they did a big test to try and get it up that river. That river had so many rocks, it was a bit of a disaster, and they wound up selling it south. And we got it here in Newburn for a year or so. Yeah. So, um, so what eventually happened to uh, steamboats is that for carrying cargoes, they were replaced by towboats and barges. Okay. You know, towards the end of the Did the railroad season. have anything to do with that? Uh, some, although interesting thing is actually in terms of fuel cost, it's more efficient to move something over water than, than, than on rails. Okay, uh, so, especially downstream. Uh, yeah, or, or upstream if you've got mm -hmm. an engine. Uh, and uh, uh, so... Um, I wouldn't say that the railroads put steamboats out of business because they didn't. Um, I, but I would say that the the idea of modular transport, which railroads developed with the separate railroad cars, well, that converted to uh, to American riverways uh -huh. meant that you could have barges with different containers, and those barges could have an origin and a, and a destination. Different barges could be made. Uh, could have different destinations, and you'd make up tow, to use the, the uh, uh, riverboatman's expression, uh, at different places. You stop stop in at Cairo, and you drop off these three barges, which you know, mm -hmm. means you have to you have you have to, to uh, detach them from from the tow that you've made made up. But you might be adding some barges, and then at Natchez, you might do the same thing. And that actually has continued up to the present day. It's remarkable how much. 
of uh, American goods travel within the continental United States on rivers, mm-hmm. with towboats and barges. If you're ever flying over one of our major rivers, you can see you can see like a massive, you may see a you know big 12 barge, 20 barge tow with a great big uh, right. towboat with uh, which you know these giant diesel engines like 10,500 horsepower, I think is fairly standard mm-hmm. for a large towboat operating on the rivers. Now the, the river boats were a, a, a romantic ideal at the time. Uh, during their heyday, Twain talked about and in his life on the Mississippi, how when I was a, he said, when I was a boy, there was but one permanent ambition among my comrades, and that was to be a steamboat pilot. Well, it's yes, it is glamorous in a society that exists on the banks of these rivers. And, you know, these uh, places like Dubuque, Iowa, and mm-hmm. Natchez, Natchez under the hill, uh, you know, grew to be thriving river ports. And you might one way of thinking of it is that the uh, uh, you know that the the steamboat is the most romantic uh, method of transport, and it goes somewhere. You can go to other places. Not it's it's got all that old tradition and image to it. The cotton bales, the gamblers, the uh, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah uh-huh. there's, there's all of that, which of course you know films have romanticized, just as they've romanticized uh, uh, you know the cattle industry. Um, a lot of which is made possible by the railroads. I I actually you know rather than thinking of railroads as replacing uh, steamboats, which they did not. Uh, really, it's, it's barges and, 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 and towboats that replaced them. Uh, rather, I would think that, uh, think of the different parts of the, of the continental United States and how, uh, what sort of transport is possible. You know, canalers in New York were a big deal. There's lots of canalers songs from uh-huh. after the completion of the Erie Canal and others. But Pennsylvania, for example, the topography doesn't lend itself to canal building as much as New yeah. York's does. Yeah, they had a little bit of a canal system. But, a little uh, bit, but, but Pennsylvania uh, mm-hmm. was quicker to develop railroads, which were better suited to their topography. Right. And so, uh, so in Pennsylvania, maybe the glamorous mode of transport is, is, is mm-hmm. the railroad. I wouldn't say that uh, uh, you know <laughs> mule pulling pulling a flatboat at the Erie Canal is very romantic, but there were songs written about it. And that was how yeah, people got around in yeah. New York for a while. Yeah, Mark Twain wrote a a epic poem once yeah. about a canal boat. Yeah, and I mean it was a mocking epic poem, oh, sure. talking about this horrific storm and all the dangerous <laughs> water, and finally the people stepped off out in the boat and stepped on the shore. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's an entertaining little piece. I lived in Western Pennsylvania for many years yeah. and uh up in mercer county yeah and mercer county itself that area was settled by primarily by veterans of a revolutionary war they had no money to pay them so said here's some dirt out here in western pennsylvania you have a harm yeah and um and they would run up to lake erie for the in the war of 1812 when they were needed to join the ships and things like that but in the county i lived there was a particular stretch of ground where there was an old canal boat mm-hmm. uh trench mm-hmm. and i remember them trying to raise money to turn that into a tourist attraction they never did mm-hmm. but there was a little museum in greenville pennsylvania if you ever happened to be there mm-hmm. and inside they had a large replica of a canal boat wonderful and it was about twice a, that out if i ever yeah it was about twice the length of this room oh yeah and uh, it, it was an interesting, interesting thing. It was, of course, hauled along by mules or oxen right. or cattle or whatever they could find to drag mules, it up and down. Mules, That's how it went up mules and down. Standard, but, uh, standard, yeah. And, yeah. Part, and part of building a canal is building building a towpath. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe two. I'm not sure if they're you know if you go both yeah. both ways or you put a towpath on on both sides. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, and it was a very agricultural region, of course. Yeah. So that's yeah. a lot of what it was used yeah. for. Yeah. So I'm not saying that Pennsylvania didn't have canals, right? But were but but I do remember. But the railroad was much more significant. Yeah, the, the railroad was better suited to the topography. Mm-hmm. You know, where where you wanted to move goods yeah. from and to. Well, in the west, when what was then the western part of the United States in the you know first half of the 19th century, uh, water transport was a sensible way to do it because you've got you've got the Ohio River, the Missouri right. River, you know those those meet with the Mississippi and go all the way down to New Orleans, so that allowed people to uh, to grow produce or make things in 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 the western part of the United States, which could then be uh, could be traded overseas once they're once they were down mm-hmm. in in, uh, in New Orleans. 
So, um, and, and really that, you know, that has never gone away. Uh, a lot of, of our country's export uh, passes through those river systems and is eventually shipped mm-hmm. to water in ports, ports like, uh, like, like New Orleans. So I wouldn't say that, the, um, that steamboats went away so much as for carrying cargo. Now, for carrying right. passengers, uh, the, I think the Delta Queen is still, is still operational. Yeah, we've, we've still got steamboats out there. They're more of a tourist attraction. A lot of them, that paddle wheel is nothing but decoration. I know down in Savannah, they've got that great big uh, paddle boat hooked up to the shore. I don't know if it's a real paddle boat or not. Well, I know in um, Wilmington there's the Henrietta. Mm-hmm. Henrietta, well, it was the Henrietta One, which was you know historical. Yep. Henrietta Two was there when I lived in Wilmington in the early nineties, mm-hmm. and now there's a Henrietta Three. And I know all of the Henriettas, <laughs> they don't they don't have propellers. It's the, <laughs> pad, it's the paddle. It's the paddles that make them go. Yeah, yeah. There's one up in. Um, I know there's one up in Pittsburgh. It's very popular up there. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. I mean, it's pure tourism. You get on. You have a show. You have dinner. You come to shore. Yeah. And uh, I I. I believe on the Mississippi, they still have. Uh, yes, again, right. tourism is a, the primary angle of them today. Sure. Well, the idea of going on a river cruise, river cruises mm-hmm. in Europe have become enormously popular. Uh, you know, up and down the Danube and the Rhine, and mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but it's something that you know in, in the mid twentieth century that was a really popular thing. Right. To do. Especially yeah. especially people were inclined to seasickness. You're like, okay, you could mm-hmm. you know say you could. Take a, a cruise ship out of out of Miami, but if you're prone to seasickness, you, you know all, all that wonderful food they're going to serve you is <laughs> not not going to do you much good. Uh, yeah, and, one thing the ships are so huge, it's hard for them to rock very much. But oh yeah, <laughs> we were on a cruise once. There was a day different. We were on a cruise once or twice, and there were a couple one time. There were there were a couple of days we weren't allowed out on the deck because right. of the winds yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, and well, I've it, never been on a cruise, but I've the, done some deep water sailing uh, uh-huh. in, in, in sail training vessels. And uh, uh, anyway, um, mm-hmm. it's uh, so river cruises have been popular for a long time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, can, you can say it's tourism. Sure, it's tourism. What's, what's wrong but with tourism? It's, it's fun tourism. It's it's good money. Uh, anyway, uh, now tell us a little bit about. I'm sure you know something about uh, Mr. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, and how he got that name. Uh, it, it's a terminology of river boating. Uh, not only river boating, but a lot of the river boating uh, terminology is derived from deep water mm-hmm. uh, ter- terminology. Um, sometimes a, a, you know, a deep water sailor would uh, swallow the anchor, as the expression is, to you know to go mm-hmm. ashore and uh, end up working. Uh, um, compressing cotton and the holds of cotton ships in mm-hmm. Biloxi, uh, Mobile, or New Orleans, or Galveston, uh, or uh, or might end up working on a riverboat. So, yeah. um, sounding the depth of the water is something that goes back uh, at least for hundreds and probably thousands of years. And especially in a river, that's pretty vital. Mm, well, in deep water, it can be pretty vital too. You know, it's nice mm-hmm. to. You know, ni- ni- nice to know the water's getting shallow before <laughs> before you run aground. <laughs> and and in fact, I won't go too far down this rabbit hole. But since I've I've, I've done work with the history of navigation in uh, medieval Europe, um, northern in northern Europe, taking soundings was much more a part of navigational practice. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's lots of places you can run aground. The tides are more complicated. In the Mediterranean, they were using visual references more. The depth, mm-hmm. uh, the the depth and consistency of the bottom was more consistent. So, taking soundings uh, with a sounding lead, a big hunk of lead, usually with a little hollow in the bottom, which you could uh, you could um, arm, as it was called, with uh, with wax and you know something something that'll pick up a bottom sample. And then you you know heave heave this if you're if you're moving you have to you have to put the um, your leadsman as he's called in uh, your forward uh, the, the foremast chains as they're called the supports for the for the shrouds of the foremast and there's a whole way of, of doing it you heave heave the thing forward and then there are marks on the lead line. And uh, so those marks, at a glance, you can see what the depth is. So that's heaving the lead? Uh, Yes, it's called heaving the lead. Ah, you've just saved me from mispronouncing something tonight. Thank Uh, you very much. (laughs) (laughs) And and so you could, uh, uh, and so it came to me that, so the leadsman is way up forward in Mm -hmm. the, um, 
uh, in the four mast chains, as they're called, the supports for the uh, uh, for the, the the shrouds of the of the foremast, and um, and so he would call back to the officer of the deck uh, the what the depth was, and there are customary ways of doing that. Um, you could be by the mark uh, or by the deep, and by the mark is where that that mark. You know, it, it, there were different marks for different depths. Uh, could be a piece of leather with a hole in it, or a rag, a red rag, or a white rag, or if you get to the deeper depths, uh, a little piece of line with a certain number of knots tied in it. And so, for example, if um, if it was uh, uh, not quite on the mark, six fathoms, he would call by the deep six. Okay. Deep sixing something, you know, if it's if it's six fathoms fath fathoms in the water, you're probably not going to be able to retrieve it. Um, and then um, if it was right on the mark for two fathoms, then he could call out, by the mark, Twain. Okay, and okay. That, that was considered safe water at that point. Is that correct? It depends on the depth of your vessel. If you've got ah. a really deep draft vessel, Mark Twain could be, whoa, <laughs> let's, let's get into deeper <laughs> the, the, water. The, most river boats are fairly shallow draft. Uh, they were, they were. So Mark Twain, I'm, I'm thinking was probably enough water for most mm -hmm. Mississippi river boats to, yeah. uh, to, to make it through. Now, I, I should explain that the technology changed a little bit from uh, deep water to, to river navigation, even though the terminology for the depths remained the same. Mm -hmm. Because uh, a lead line, you got this line you know, with, with marks on it, you gotta coil it, you gotta step out into the chains, you know, heave it forward as the ship, and then uh, as your vessel gets more or less directly above it, that's where you read the depth. Uh -huh. um, all that could take a while on uh, on the Mississippi, where you've got um, where you've got sawyers, as they're called, like trees trees that have ended up in the water with their roots sticking up, just ready to disembowel. Mm -hmm. the ship. Those are called sawyers, by the way. Um, I used to think the Mississippi Sawyer, it's a fiddle tune, was, uh, was, was about someone who sawed wood in the Mississippi. No, 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 no. <laughs> a Sawyer is, is a root. For it's a, about trees that saw boats. It's just waiting to rip, rip the bottom of your, uh -huh. of, of your hull out. Uh, and so for various reasons, uh, the waters tended to be shallower uh, on, on our river systems. And so in, maybe they started off heaving a lead, a lead in line. Mm -hmm. But uh, relatively early on in in uh, the hit in steam navigation of the rivers, they switched over to using a big long pole that was painted alternate colors like white and black or white and red, and the fathom marks, which are six feet. You know, fathom is easy for a sailor to measure. It's the the length uh -huh. of your out outstretched arms, uh, and so those would be marked in alternate colors by each fathom, so that you'd and you'd have usually two. I think they're still called leadsmen on a uh, on a riverboat. So you, you see where the ter terminology mm -hmm. is, is is borrowed from deep water navigation, but they right. adapted the technology. And so in shallow or unknown waters, or they might be familiar waters where there's mm -hmm. just been major rains, and that's changed the location of the bars on the on the river. You'd usually have two leadsmen, uh, port and starboard on the bow of your steamboat, and they've both got these big long poles, and they're calling an alternation so that mm -hmm. you're getting a depth sounding in twice, in half the time that it would take one leadsman to give that to you. In, okay. in dangerous waters, that was, I know, customary mm -hmm. practice on American rivers. Two leadsmen, both of these big long poles painted in alternate, al alternate colors, and they're, as, as their pole is vertical, they're calling the depth back to the, the captain up on the All right, now, Sam Clemens, uh, how he got into river boating was, was fairly interesting, and, and the name, by the way, he, another sailor was doing some writing and called himself Mark Twain, and I believe that Clemens really ridiculed and lambasted the guy in a little article he wrote, and the guy was so upset he quit writing. And, uh, I mean, Clemens had that great ability to rip people to shreds. If you've oh, ever read his uh, autobiography, <laughs> biography, boy, he really lights into some people. Uh, his caustic humor is legendary. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. And uh, his Bret Hart, the writer Bret Hart, he despised that man. And, oh, he just rips him to pieces. But nonetheless, uh, Clemens 
was looking for a way to get rich, like any young man would be looking for. And he heard there was a big, and he heard about all the gold going on down in South America. Mm -hmm. So he decided he was going to go to South America. And being an impetuous young man who does not do a lot of his research, he read that in the book and said, this is great. I'm going to go down to New Orleans. And once I'm down there, I'm going to hop on a boat and go on down to South America. And he never bothered to check to see if there were any boats going to South America. <laughs> and so he goes all the way down to New Orleans, and there are no boats going to South America. So he's sitting there stuck, broke. And he finally returns to his childhood dream. Well, maybe I can get on a steamboat yeah. and, and learn to pilot. And so he... Uh, Located a man named Bill Bixby, not the same guy who played the Incredible Hulk on TV. <laughs> or, or, or the newspaper man in My Favorite Martian. That's my uh, favorite Bill yeah. Bixby role. Yeah. He, was also, he also played a, a crime-solving magician once called The Magician. I remember that show, too. It was relatively brief. Yeah. And he I went to the same high school. I oh, did he indeed? Yeah, yeah, even though he's portrays an Angelino in My Favorite Martian, he was really the same <laughs> Okay. Magician. But then Ray Dalton, the Martian, was really from the deep south somewhere. There, there you go. <laughs> Almost Mars. So anyway, yeah. And so uh, now Bixby trained him. But uh, and if you read Life on the Mississippi, uh, Sippy, an excellent book, uh, yeah. he talks quite a bit about that. But Mr. Bixby would go on and uh, become quite a legend himself in steamboating. He He developed a lot of the navigational markers and that kind of thing that went on the river as it developed. Yeah. And of course, and, and, and until it became a, as, as Twain said, it got to the point with the dredging and everything, life and steamboating became much more simple than when he first learned. And of course, back in, in Twain's day, there were no dams, there were no locks, that kind of thing. And the, and the river, as he said, would rewrite itself. Rewrite it would itself. totally, it would yeah. make new islands, it would wash away old islands. Yes. And uh, just... And, and so there's that, that immense challenge of having to memorize the entire river and recognize every little change that went along. And so it was uh, quite the thing when you learned. Enormously yeah. challenging. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's part of the romance of being a, a river pilot. Yeah, I'm sure so. Before, before the channels were all kept. Yeah, and then the Civil War started. The Yankees put a cannonball through his smokestack. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much ended his riverboating days. Way, and and uh, river boatmen called... Uh, people say smokestack, and actually the one place where you have smokestacks is on a factory. Okay. Because in a deep water vessel, it's called a funnel, and river boatmen call, call them chimneys. Chimneys, okay. And don't forget that Mississippi is pronounced Mississippi when, you, when you're from Mississippi. Okay. It's one less syllable, Mississippi. Um, I, I have been taught to never say New Orleans. So. Yeah, I don't right, say New Orleans. That's, uh, Every state has its little, no, 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 you got to pronounce it this way. People always say New Orleans. I've never heard anybody say that. They say New Orleans. You know, it's it's subtle, but it's not that New Orleans. Thing. That, that New Orleans, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that doesn't happen. It's, uh -huh. it's New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you have had other connections with Mark Twain in your research, uh, the Quaker City. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, Twain traveled. His first big book was called The Innocents Abroad. Yeah. And it was a new kind of travel book. Everything bef before it had been melodramatic and dreamy and, and <laughs> Ivanhoe-ish. Yeah. And uh, all these elaborate beauties. And Mark Twain did his travels on the Quaker City, which is a, a tour ship that was supposed to have General Sherman on it, but he backed out. And he went across and he wrote what he saw. Yeah. And it, it really changed what the book was about because he gave an honest Yankee opinion of everything, and uh, he he just uh, demythologized Europe in it. But you've done some research regarding the Quaker City. Yeah, my focus was on food, mm -hmm. actually, because I was researching uh, a book which I, I uh, which which I published, or rather that Roman and Littlefield published in 2014, called "Food at Sea: Shipboard Cuisine from Ancient to Modern Times." Is that a nonfiction title or what? <laughs> you know, you know, fiction titles have to like grab you, but yeah, yeah, shipboard cuisine from ancient to modern times, food at sea, and uh, it was interesting to see the things that he wrote about food uh, aboard uh, Quaker City. Quaker City is interesting. The steamboat was converted to military use during the war. And then a whole group of people decided that they were going to go to the Holy Land and visit all the interesting places along the way. It's actually a very early example of a cruise mm -hmm. where 
you're, you know, generally speaking, passenger vessels in the 19th and even the early 20th century are taking you from point A to point B, usually by as direct a route as possible. And they may offer you onboard entertainment and good fine dining and all of that. But still, the purpose of the voyage is to get from to get you there. B. Yeah, whereas the idea of a cruise where you're just going for the experience of being on a boat and maybe visiting some interesting places uh, along the way, uh, Quake, the, that Quaker City voyage is a very early example of that in, what was mm-hmm. it, 1866? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And he, he himself referred to it as the world's first pleasure cruise. Yeah. And, I mean, he may have been wrong, but I'll bet no, he, was he was not right. far from I right. Was, it may not have been the world's first, but it was a very early example. And then that became more popular uh, in the early 20th century with uh, some European lines converting their uh, their ships to Mediterranean cruises. Prohibition mm-hmm. did a lot in, in this country to uh, the so-called booze cruises, <laughs> right. where they would go to foreign ports of questionable touristic <laughs> interest, you know, some little, some little fishing village on the, uh, you know, somewhere in the Canadian Maritimes. And the passengers didn't care because once they were past the, yeah. you know, the, the vessel was Get out there, pet, yeah. and going to a foreign port, then... Get uh, into international waters. Yeah, and, once they're in international away. waters, they could just drink themselves into oblivion and, uh, you know, kind of a floating uh-huh. speakeasy. If you so know. what kind of food did they eat on the Quaker City? What kind of food did they eat on the river boats. So. Um, now, if I had a copy of my book handy, you could tell me. <laughs> I, could tell uh, I gave you no warning about this at all. But <laughs> I can. Uh, you can read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's a copy in the new available on Amazon now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody, Amazon. everybody, open <laughs> Amazon.com. Look up Simon Spaulding. Food at Sea: Shipboard Cuisine from Ancient to Modern And uh, times. I've read the book, and it is a very interesting book. It really is. Yeah, I did. Well, thank you. And uh, I remember there were collops. Uh, Dickens also, you know, in in uh, uh, American notes for for uh, general. What was it? Oh, American. Well, anyway, American notes the Dickens mm-hmm. Dickens book about his his trip to uh, to the United States. Yeah, uh, he talks about the food on the Cunard steamer Britannia, one of the first Cunard liners, um, on the way over, and then on the George Washington, the sailing packet uh, packet vessel that he took back. Um, food for, for passengers was was more delectable than than the food. Food uh, for crews on, on mm-hmm. working uh, working boats, but there are challenges of how to uh, how to serve relatively fresh food to people in an age before refrigeration. Uh-huh. One of the solutions I know this was true of the Britannia. I don't remember if it was true of the Quaker City. Was that they kept a cow on board, which they milked, and so you could have fresh milk and cream from the <laughs> ship's cow in that kind of padded stall. Did they salt their food? Pack it in salt. Uh, Yes, um, fish was was packed in salt. Cod, cod, and uh, and herring were packed in salt. Beef and pork were kept in brine in in in, in a very strong um, salt salt solution, and that salt beef was known as uh, uh, salt horse uh, or uh, salt junk sometimes, uh, and on vessels that carried passengers but also had crew. Uh, I do remember a, a quote where the the more desirable cuts of f- of meat, which are described as the fattier cuts, went aft for the officers and the passengers, and then the lean cuts were served to the crew. Wow! Nineteenth century standards on yeah. On, on I imagine that would be very salty meat. Uh, yeah, is is customarily customarily desalinated uh-huh. in a, a wooden cask that has a padlock on it, so people don't help themselves to it. Uh, which is called a harness cask. Again, okay. Continuing on that horse, that horse analogy that sailors are fond of. And you're about trying to suck some of that salt out of it then before you serve it. Right. Exactly. Okay. Is that where we got salt pork? Uh, well, <laughs> I can't. It, it, we're in a chicken and an egg situa- thing yeah. there. You know, pork, pork has been salted for a very yeah. long time. It probably has something to do with the invention of hardening of the arteries, however. <laughs> <laughs> but. But yes, salt pork was carried. It could be either in dry salt or in brine like the beef right. mm-hmm. uh, at, at sea. And I know ashore, salt pork was a common issue for uh, uh, yeah. soldiers during, during the Civil War. Yeah, a little, a little rabbit hole you mentioned Dickens. And since we're talking to Wayne today, uh, Dickens was in America. He was in New York giving a lecture. And uh, Sam Clemens had been invited by a coal baron 
by the name of Langdon uh, to, to come to New York to watch it. And it was there. He brought his daughters along with him, and Sam sat with him, and it was there at a Dickens lecture that Sam met his future bride, Olivia Langdon Clemens. Oh and uh, it would become, a lot of people don't know, it's one of the great love stories of history is uh, these two in, in, in their lives together. How did you guys get interested in Mark Twain? How did you get it? I mean, <laughs> I think it was required reading. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was. Uh, uh, I think outside of the schools that uh, yeah, threw the book out from the Sawyer for that inward school. thing, yeah, but, yeah, that was my introduction. The jumping frog, yeah, from Calaveras County and stuff. But oh, I mean, an in-depth, um, uh-huh. you know, your in-depth yeah. knowledge and and you know history of. Uh, yeah. For me, Twain was one of my earliest literary interests, and and uh, it quickly went beyond uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn as I started finding others of his work. And, and I've always had these weird little semi-connections to him. Um, he spent all of his summers early on in Elmira, New York. In fact, that's where he wrote Tom uh, Huckleberry Finn and some of his most famous works were written there on his sister-in-law's farm out at Quarry, Quarry Farm, which is now, by the way, one of the two main Mark Twain research centers in the country, the other one's in California. And uh, my mother's family came from that area, from right up around there. When I lived in uh, Greenville, Jamestown, Pennsylvania, I've talked about Greenville a little before, and in Jamestown there was this place known as the Gibson House or the Mark Twain Manor. And the Gibson House was built by William Gibson in 1865. It was completed. People used to say it was part of the Underground Railroad, but it didn't start until the Civil War was over. But uh, Mr. Gibson was a shyster type of doctor he would send his advertisements out send me your urine samples and i'll i'll look at it and and i will give you your cure based on what i find in your urine the urine would come he'd toss it out the window and they'd send out his medicines mm-hmm. um, but gibson got a job per se to collect specimens for the uh, smithsonian institution and he got onto a boat called the quaker city mm and went over there, and Twain even mentions him early on in the book, mentioning this man of this incredibly long, frightening title about, uh, I forget the exact phrase, but something of a collector of Smithsonian Institution or whatever, and he said, if I'd have known then, he was only nothing more than a poor old fossil. <laughs> but uh, the guy didn't hold it against him too much, because when Mark Twain came to speak in a town called Sharon, not too far away from Jamestown, he was invited and stayed overnight at the Gibson house yeah, right. and hence it became the Mark Twain Manor and the only story I rem- I know that was often spoken of was how Twain stayed there and he came down for breakfast in his bare feet which absolutely shocked the hostess mm-hmm. uh, at, at the impropriety of it and Gibson would later <clears throat> he was an interesting character he later wanted to start a college in little Jamestown town of 1,000 people uh, Lutheran College and it would uh, be founded instead in Greenville, seven miles away, and he was so furious at that that he took all the money he was going to give and instead built like a 40, 50-foot monument to himself in the local cemetery. <laughs> so we're and, all it, of- and it stands to this day, this immense big statue to this uh, huh. wealthy but shyster doctor who knew Mark Twain. That's fascinating. So you were saying earlier that uh, Mark Twain's name came from the... From the steamboat te- terminology, yeah, yes. Yeah, steamboat terminology. Well... And then you said Sawyer's were those stumps that stick up like Tom Sawyer. Right. Were all of his characters and, and themes kind of um, riverboat related like that? I mean, what's Huckleberry Finn? Yeah, that? I don't know if Tom if Tom, he named Tom Sawyer after that terminology or not. I've, I've, never, I, I I've never thought of that. When you said that, I, I began to wonder. But, uh, and certainly not all, all of his characters. Yeah. But, I, but I think the language of the river was an idiom that, with which he was familiar. And having been immersed in it yeah, and for a part of this. I wonder what a huckleberry is. Is that somebody dumb or something? I do not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, huckleberry was based on a real person, which I'll talk about tonight. His, his name was Tom Blinkenship. Uh-huh. And uh, he would eventually become a uh, district justice, a justice of peace out in Montana. Twain was writing about him once and said that. But he was a real character. Many of the characters in that book were based on Aunt Polly was his mother, uh, the really obnoxious brother who's always tattling on him was his brother Henry, who, by the way, died in a horrific steamboat accident. Um, and that story is interesting because Twain had a dream 
kind of like Lincoln had a dream about his death. Well, Twain had a dream where he walks into this room and there's this coffin in the middle and he finds it's his brother. And he and his brother worked on a steamboat. Uh, his brother Henry was not a steamboat man. He was not a pilot, but he worked on steamboats. Twain got him the job. And he and Twain were on this one steamboat and this guy started harassing his brother and Twain hauled off and smacked the guy hard. And so he was thrown off that steamboat and put on another one. So Henry goes up the river the next day on the, the original steamboat and it blows up. The boiler blew up. And uh, those were pretty awful incident, people dying of uh, the scalding and everything else. And he, Clemens found out about it and went to his brother's aid when he was found on shore later. He managed to make it to shore, but he died about three days later. But, uh, and, and Twain had dreamed of it. Wow. And as was his want, he went on through most of his life blaming himself for not being there for his brother's death. But uh, it, it, it's an interesting story there, too. I, I don't get into that story, but it, it's... Yeah. 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 It's a fascinating story. And and so much of so much of everything... His, his actual time on the river, I suspect, was not that long. Yeah. Um, well, you know, my time... But it built into him so my deeply. My time sailing, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. hour for hour, day for day, probably wasn't all that long. I, I you know, I sailed on the in the schooner Pioneer yeah. out of New York City off and on over a period of mm -hmm. several years. But um, but that was only at certain times of the year. Uh, There's only a few days that I spent sailing on Barcalissa and Brig Niagara. And then I have my one, well, two two trips on Savisha Czarne, a Polish sailing mm -hmm. vessel, one across the Atlantic in 1992, and then one across the Baltic and back in 93. Yeah. So I suppose if you looked at the the days of my life, the number of days that I spent yeah. sailing are probably fairly small, but but that stuck with me in a lot a lot of ways. I was already interested. Yeah, in there are certain things that it this. it gets into your blood. It, it's yeah. it's yeah. that thing that is 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 you. It's it's like when I identify what town did you grow up? In? I say, well, I, I grew up in in Townville, Pennsylvania, a little town of around three hundred people, and I spent all of two years there, but so much of my formative time was there. Yeah. That that's what I remember growing up. That is my my hometown. Um, yeah. Uh, Twain, as I got more and more into him, I was just so absolutely fascinated by who the person was and uh, the, the many incredible intricacies. A man so loyal and loving, and yet so vicious when he wanted to be, mm -hmm. uh, and, and just all the various things in, well, and, and that. But flaws because that, that get rich yeah. quick drive was always there. I think he was. Uh, one of the reasons that he had financial troubles in his later life was he, you know, if someone came along with a get rich scheme, he was like, you know, it was and, hard and he could be so so incredibly trusting. Yeah, that yeah. was a, the famous page typesetter, of which one still exists up in Hartford, Connecticut, at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, yeah, that drove him into deep deep financial. And uh, if he hadn't done that, would he be as famous as he was today? Because it was that world lecturing tour that made him a world icon. Uh, if he had found that boat down to South America, would anybody have ever heard of him? Would he have yeah. disappeared down there? And yeah. He probably wouldn't have gotten rich because he was not the kind of man who could ever do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I know but, a lot of those lecture tours were driven by his, his by his financial fine, problem, deep financial debt. He wanted to. By some of those get rich quick. Yeah, when all the money started going away and they realized they were dead broke, and uh, his wife said, "You are not going to declare bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. No way are you going to do that." And so he did that long lecture tour. Yeah, uh, he had some friends put all of his books into his wife's name so the creditors couldn't take his books. Mm. Yeah, and that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it's like uh, I'm I'm very much into theater, and I, I got in, it. I started theater, and uh, it it got quickly into the into the blood. It was my way of. It, it's how I climbed out of my shell, mm -hmm. and uh, some actors do that. It, I'm very very shy, the absolute wallflower. If at any event, I'm back against the wall, saying nothing. I was so shy. Mm -hmm. But then when I found when I got on a stage, I had this mask. Yeah. And I could express through that mask and not expose myself. And so that is how I was able to develop my self-confidence in that way. And that's just stuck with me. And so the, the boards. 
every everything has its own special terminology in theater, the boards and all that, and, and newspapers. Yeah, and the newspaper, it's all very violent. You you bleed a, a photograph. You have your gutters. You have it your slugs. <laughs> and uh, at least in the old days when newspapers were not all put out with computers and uh, yeah. everything else. So, yeah. Interesting. So what's yours? What's my what? Uh, what's your, <laughs> what's a, what is that thing that sinks in and it helps identify you? What, what, what is it? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess being a little... And this wouldn't surprise anybody who really knows me, but I, I tend to have, I'm a little bit Mark, like Mark Twain, like you were describing him, because I didn't know he was like that. I kind of have a, a little barb on my humor mm -hmm. and a little sarcasm. And uh, my films are that way too. There's always a little bit of, uh, there's always a little jab, you know, at someone. So whether it's political or whether it's um, social commentary or whatever, there's always, there's always a little barb. So yeah, I yeah. That's what defines me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gotten so much trouble for my sense of humor at times because people oh. take me seriously, and I've, yeah. I've I've gotten in, especially talking with people. Simon has a very curious looking <laughs> thing here. Thing, <laughs> <laughs> an unviolin. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about it, and uh, you're going to do maybe a little river music or something along those lines. Maybe we'll we'll yeah, we'll let so you go I'll for see, a couple I'll minutes and see what river, happens yeah, here. I'll about the song. This instrument has is, is uh, from a, a whole different era, but it's my newest uh, acquisition. It mm -hmm. is a fiddle based on two uh, fiddles or parts of fiddles that were found on board the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's warship that sank in 1545, and uh, it was in in battle, so it was crowded with you know not only sailors but archers and. Other man, and so it, it has yielded a, a wealth of artifacts when it was recovered in the 1980s. And since the 1980s, I've wanted to have a fiddle that was based on on the, Henry's the fiddle. Mary Rose, yeah, the Mary the, the Mary Rose fiddles. So I this might be the very instrument that he did green sleeves on, right? <laughs> <laughs> he did write pastime with good company, but 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 uh, uh, I think that's apocryphal that Henry VIII wrote uh, wrote green sleeves. But anyway, somebody on, or two somebodies because they found two two fiddles with this general body type. Uh, on board the Mary Rose, playing on something similar to this. I tweaked the, uh, some of the, the dimensions a little bit so that I could play on the strings individually and not just two at a time. And um, the design schematics for that and sent that to Truver Music Works in Pennsylvania. Uh, they've got a website. And, and, and actually, Drew, the, the luthier there, said, I don't usually do commissions, but I kind of like your design, so I'll build it for you. And so this is this is uh, my uh, my Mary Rose fiddle, which arrived just a few weeks ago. Was that tune now gathering pescuits oh okay uh, i should have recognized that yeah, they, yeah, i, I, I that thought i recognized like i know that no. song it's from my yeah. very ancient deep deep past yes. where when we the days we were trying palace and simon would drive all of us crazy teaching us gathering pescuits for a dance uh well te teaching hundreds and hundreds of school kids yes <laughs> but, so, and i'll tell you what right now i can't even vaguely remember the first step of that so we have a request. We have a request in the comments section. Oh, where the we? devil went down to Georgia. Uh, <laughs> uh, not sure if we got them. No. Uh, no. Uh, no. I, I think you might need you know, a little bit of practice there to get that one in. Talk, 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 talk. Play that fiddle and play it hot. 
<laughs> the Devils was better anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's multiple ones. Yeah, there's multi-tracking. There's not just one of Charlie Daniels. There's like I counted at least three Charlie Danielses on the, the 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 young young man's fiddle break, and then there's two or three in the Devils break with all kinds of crazy effects. Yeah, uh, well, yeah they did some reverse tracking in there too. I think. Uh, I think I heard I buried Paul somewhere in that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a box fiddle? What you'd call a box fiddle? It's similar to a cigar box yeah. fiddle, but it's it, mm-hmm. it is my interpretation of the design of one from 1545. You can have a look. If you like. Now it has a little uh, softer with, sound than yeah, a regular a fiddle, a little quieter than a regular, regular, regular one. And if you look at it, the whole body, neck, and headstock are all carved out of one piece of poplar. And I see that. How, that was a very common. Uh, manufacturing technique in the the Middle Ages and Renaissance was just to carve an instrument out of a block. Uh, some instruments are made by joinery, like the violin, which dates back to the 1520s. Now, how'd they and hollow it out like that? Uh, well, with chisels and gouges. Okay. I, was gonna say, I assume yeah, it's they, not like the canoes where they kept breath. burning their way down through. You know, I, I used to try to play the violin. I still have it, as a matter of fact. Oh, well, you, and well, well, oh no, trust me. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's... Heavier than a regular violin. Yeah, the it's violin being carved out of a block violin. like that. There's probably more. What you know, a, a violin is made of these yeah. very thin strips yeah. of wood for the sides, and then the the top and back are carved. Uh, this is yeah. This is a much simpler kind of construction, uh, but it, it's fun to see uh, part of part of an instrument that has been lying in the mud of the Solent since 1545, mm-hmm. and then you know try to reconstruct yeah. it and see what it sounds like. Uh, my my ambition is to maybe do a ukulele. That's about as high as I'm willing to go. All right. Well, I can teach you to play. The, yeah. The <laughs> trick is, can I? Several ukulele students. And and you have to play tiptoe through the tulips and somewhere <laughs> over the rainbow. Yeah, you've absolutely. got you've got absolutely. to play. But and we were in Hawaii the one time. Every time there was entertainment came, everybody sang. They were obligated to do the state song. Now practically out there somewhere over the rainbow as, uh, hmm. uh, what was his name who, who made that famous out there? Tony Tim. Uh, oh, oh, um, uh, Izzy, Izzy Kamaka Vivo Ole. Yeah, he when he died, they actually gave him a state funeral. They did, they did. And yeah, they, they, thousands they, they, turned they, out they, for they it. They poured his ashes off Hokulea, the beautiful uh, mm-hmm. reconstructed double canoe. Yeah, I've seen yeah, there. Yeah, but he did yeah. make that a be- he did turn that into a beautiful song. I think between them, uh, well, it was beautiful. It was beautiful when uh, when Ralph Blaine wrote it and mm-hmm. Judy Judy Garland sang. Right. It, uh, yeah, but he he no, gave it, Ralph Blaine. he gave it a new modern all twist. Wrong, the very uh, yeah. Uh, Ralph Blaine wrote to "Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas." Um, Arlen and ooh. Oh, and somebody's going to probably comment it in. Yeah, the two the two men who wrote over over the rainbow, uh, whose uh-huh. whose, whose names are at the tip of my tongue, but not quite coming out. Um, uh, yeah, um, it, I, I, it, I I like to think that Izzy Izzy Kamaka Vivo Ole and Jake Shimakaburo have done something to exercise the demons from the ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, he he made it sound like a real instrument, and uh, the tiny Tim did not manage that. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it true that even today, that if you're going to play in Texas, you have to have the fiddle in the band? I well, I played in the band in Texas, and I mostly played the fiddle. <laughs> so maybe maybe it is. No, uh, it wasn't even a country band. It was, it was a Celtic folk rock. <laughs> it was uh, Texas House Bill 723, Three. I think. Yes. Was, yes. You're going to play in it, Texas. One of a few bills that passed have. unanimously. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. Being, being a fiddler, I'm glad you had for uh, uh, traditions like that. Okay, do you have another? Do you have anything that uh, we might have heard out on the river or back Absolutely. in uh, 1840s, 1850s, I'm Middle so, America? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> here is a Mississippi River boat song. All right. I'm smiling, Lindy Lo, the prettiest gal I know, on the finest boat that ever float, on the Ohio, the Mississippi, or oh, the Ohio. Come smiling, Lindy Lo, cause the bell done ring to go on the finest boat that ever float on the ohio the mississippi oh the ohio come smiling lindy low come get on board or row on the finest boat that ever float on the ohio the mississippi oh the ohio oh applause applause on that one it's a song (laughs) that samuel clemens might have heard okay yeah, and he he did some uh, piano playing himself, and he played guitar too. I think. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and he he was known to sit down on the piano and belt out some old spirituals and, and other songs. The period. Do you have a spiritual at all that you can think of, or anything along those lines? Give us something else. Wait in the water. I know that one. Wait <laughs> in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And uh, come out to see Honor in uh, a- late April, and you will hear that yeah. a beautiful, beautiful rendition of that song a couple times in that show. Uh, and a brilliant arrangement. Yes. Yeah, by <laughs> an absolutely shockingly stunning arrangement by a Mr. Uh, Simon um, yeah, yeah, Spaulding. Right. Yes, that's the name. Who's performing various places around town, by the way. If you, there's a. If, is this a good time? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and give us a. Where can we catch you? Where you can catch me at um, uh, at Tap That on Pollock Street uh, on St. Patrick's Day. I'm playing from four to seven or four. To, I've actually heard different things from different people, but I'm playing sometime around happy hour. So green beer and entertainment. Uh, I don't know if they have green beer or not. I'm kind of hoping they don't, but I know about the <laughs> entertainment, and that's me. And I've got a green fiddle I'm going to play. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully the beer will be will be sort of amber colored, but the uh, but the fiddle will be color, c- colored green. And then I'm going to perform there again on Saturday the 19th from 6 to 8, I think. Uh, at tap that. Then I'm performing on the uh, on the. I didn't bring my glasses. Uh, the 18th, yes, at uh, Sarah's Big Apple Pizza. On okay, my, on my sister and I. The other day, we were stuck at home. My wife is down in Florida taking care of my, her father, who had some minor surgery, and we finally ordered a pizza there for the first time. It was amazing good pizza. pizza. They make good stuff over there. Really good pizza, and not only pizza but other Italian food. Mm-hmm. There's, there's much more to Italian food than pizza, and a lot of it is is represented on their menu. Uh, so that's me solo on the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Tap that, Sarah's Big Apple, tap that again. Uh, but wait, there's more. Um, my uh, vintage rock and roll band, I'm not calling it Oldies anymore. I think Oldies just, you know, it's sort of like Tiny Tim. You know? yeah. Like, like, yeah. Let's, let's, let's call it vintage rock and roll. Uh, the Bears are out of hibernation for two years. Cool. Hibernating. And we are going to be playing at Attitudes Pub and Grill in Riverbend, on March 26th, is that right? I didn't bring my reading glasses. Uh, yes, March 26th, March 26th uh, 7 p.m. Yeah, 7 p.m. There's a dinner. 7 to 10. Uh, there's a, like a buffet dinner meal before that. Uh, but the Bears are playing from 7 to 10, vintage rock and roll, uh, with all kinds of crazy things. Air Bears. I At one point, I went around to yard sales buying up those uh, controllers for uh-huh. Guitar Hero. And we put oh, band funny. stickers all over them. And then we usually hand out... Um, Kazoos when we play tequila, we hand out kazoos to the audience to be uh, Herb Alpert's Tijuana Brass, and um, and so that's on the twenty sixth. The Attitudes Pub and Grill, the Bears out of right. hibernation, and one more thing: I'm not performing, but I'm organizing a concert at Riverside United Methodist Church where I am music director. Oh, all right, and that is on Sunday afternoon, March twentieth, and that is the group Bag End. Um, uh, two good friends of mine. Sounds uh, very hobbitish. Uh, yeah, very hobbitish name and <laughs> kind of hobbitish guys who do great, great music. <laughs> Little they, guys with hairy feet. Come on they, out and see them. Yeah, they do a lot of vintage mellow rock and roll. I won't go and call it oldies. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to excise the word oldies from my vocabulary. I say I play yeah. in an oldies band. People go, oh, how nice for yeah, you. <laughs> now you mentioned Tijuana the brass. Now the rest of the day I'm going to be thinking ba 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 ba. Um, you, you've given me an evil, bum, bum, evil man. Bum, 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 bum. Um, and so Bag End is performing at Riverside United uh-huh. Methodist Church, a free concert at 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, March 20th. All right. Sounds great. Yeah. And that's uh, that, That's all my, my press stuff for, for March. All right. Very quickly, can I ask a question? Please. How many stringed instruments do you own? I have lost track. It's got to be over 200. Wow. But it's sort of hard to say because every now and then I loan out, loan out instruments yeah. and don't necessarily get them back. So uh, I, I'm doing that less. <laughs> you should have little library cards on the back of them. That would there be you a go. good idea. <laughs> if I had started doing that when I was about 19 years old, who knows? I might I might have That's 220 <laughs> instruments instead of 200. But, um, yeah, I really have kind of lost track. Yeah. We built an addition to our house. To, to yeah, Simon has this huge room, and when you look at it, it is wall-to-wall instrumentation. Wow. Yeah. I would imagine about 80% of that instrumentation is string. More than 80%, I think, because, yeah, yeah I'm really – 
as as a multi instrumentalist, I know people who play wind instruments and brass instruments and piano, and 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 I'm not that person. Uh, I do play a lot of different musical instruments, but n- most mm-hmm. of them have strings. I've learned a few percussion instruments: yes. the Irish bowron, the the uh, Acadian triangle, tifar, bastrang. Um, so you can hire out Simon to play anywhere for you, but remember there will be strings attached. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, so how do you keep them all in shape? Because I know there's some maintenance, and I mean you have to loosen the strings. You know, if they're sitting a while. Oh, really? No, no. You most there are some instruments where you customarily loosen the high tension strings. Sitar is one of those. I've got a sitar. I don't remember if I loosened the the melody string last time I put it away. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, yeah, there's maintenance. You know, strings break and you replace them. Uh, yeah. um, most of them I take out and play once, one, one, once in a while. Um, so yeah, keep keep up most of them. And every now and mm-hmm. then I find. An instrument needs some TLC. For example, uh, before COVID, I used to go out to California, which is where I'm originally from, once or twice a year to perform. And uh, it sounds a little decadent when you have a large collection of instruments. Instead of trying to carry them all uh, on, on the plane, I have a few instruments that I leave out there, and I just play play when I'm there. I realize they're not getting played most of the year, but I sure appreciate them when I'm out there. I'll bet. Yeah. And yeah, and two years ago, I was out there playing, and my California fiddle, I was noticed. I noticed on uh, the Thursday, e- my Thursday evening gig, it was just starting to bulge out a little bit at the at, at, at the end, and by Sunday, it was bulging a little more, and it had gone flat by a half step. Well, you know, this instrument is carved out of a block, so it's pretty mm-hmm. solid. But a violin, you've got two very thin pieces of wood coming together, glued to an end block on the inside, and then sandwiched between the top and back. If those glue joints start to fail, um, it, it can be really serious. The, the instrument yeah. would be, be permanently unplayable. So two years ago, I thought, well, I'm going to come back to, back to, I'm going to take this fiddle back to North Carolina. They have instrument repairmen out there, um, but I knew we have very good instrument repairmen here. Uh, uh-huh. uh, James Wickline at, at Fuller's Music is, is an okay. absolutely superb instrument repairman. And so I brought my California fiddle back back to New Bern for, uh, for Wick, as we call him, to, uh, uh, to repair it. He repaired it. And then last week I was in California, and I brought my California fiddle back out and left it there. Okay. No, we are about out of time here. Oh uh, again, inviting. Ken, hardly, I hope you yeah. got a chance to talk before. He's he's had a few <laughs> words in here. He will, we'll get him, we'll get him to talk more next time. Yeah. He's uh, Ken. Ken's a, a, a little less knowledgeable on what we hit today, yeah. but he, he can he can prattle on. He's 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 getting in there. Uh, March Wayne this weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Still plenty of time to get your tickets. You can get them at the door if you like. And I, th- I thought maybe I'd take us out with just a little quick, short piece of Twain's. Uh, he would, he had a tendency to be a bit politically incorrect. <laughs> and some people might consider his little story a little bit that way. But uh, now, and it goes as follows. This is from his days out in San Francisco. He says, now, I, I went out to San Francisco. I was broke. I, mean, I, I showed up at a hotel there. And the, the lady at the desk I had this awful cold. She said if I wanted to cure it, I should drink a quart of whiskey every 24 hours. Now, now it was interesting advice. I had a friend who said the exact same thing to me. That makes half a gallon. I drank it. The cold died. I survived. Now, while I was out there, I met this poet friend, and he was down on his luck. He, like me, had no job, and he told me that he thought his life was a failure, and I said, I agreed. And then he said, I think, I think I'm going to kill myself. And I told him, all right. Now, it was just disinterested advice to a friend in time of trouble. All right, there was a little bit of self-interest involved. I knew that if uh, he did that, I could get a scoop and land a job on a newspaper. Now, <laughs> my friend wanted to kill himself with a pistol, which was very extravagant. We could not have hired a pistol between us. A fork would have been easier. But finally, he said that he would go ahead and drown himself. And I said, all right, the only trouble being he was an excellent swimmer. But even so, we went down to the beach together. I went along to make sure things were done right. And when we arrived on the shore, a most romantical thing happened. There came in on that broad Pacific something that had been floating along for years. It was something that was full of meaning for that poor poet. It was a life preserver. (laughs) Now, here was a problem, but, but I had an idea. 
He never had any ideas, especially when he was writing poetry, but I had an idea. I told him we should take that life preserver and pawn it for a pistol. So the pawnbroker, he gave us a rusty old Derringer with a bullet about the size of a hickory nut. When I told him it was for a poet who wanted to shoot himself, he didn't even quibble over the price. Still, it was a terrible moment as my friend stood there, that pistol against his head, trembling. And finally I said, oh, all right, go ahead and pull the trigger. And he did. And that bullet carried away all the gray matter in his brains. It also took away the poetic faculty, and he has been a useful and functioning member of society ever since. <laughs> so there you go. That's a, a little bit of what you'll hear. Yeah. So I'm Bill Hand, uh, Ken Hess, Paul. Simon. I almost said Paul Simon. Yes. <laughs> Simon <laughs> Spaulding. I don't know why I do that. I'm always doing that with you. Simon Spaulding, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. And thank you, Eric.